The emphasis of this presentation is on uh, the primary sources and uh, methodology. And because Middle Chinese is kind of the major in on Old Chinese or one of the major ins on Old Chinese, uh, the, 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 uh, it will be mostly about Middle Chinese. So here goes. So we'll look at sources and methods, as I said. So for sources, uh, and let's say if these terms, any term like rhyme table isn't meaningful to you yet, just wait <laughs> and we'll get to it. So, uh, so one source is the rhyme tables. Uh, another source are the rhyme books. Uh, those are both about middle Chinese. Then we get to the practice of early poetry. Now this is sort of direct evidence of old Chinese and the structure of the Chinese script itself, which is also uh, gives you some phonetic information about old Chinese. And I want to emphasize that these four sources are used by all practitioners of old Chinese historical phonology. And then uh, Baxter and Cigar, uh, 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 in particular, and other people to, to a lesser extent, use loan words into non-Synetic languages and sort of other ancil ancillary evidence. But these are really the pillars of, of, of old Chinese um, reconstruction. So let's look at the rhyme tables first. So there was a, a book. Uh, a rhyme table called the Yunjing, published in uh, 1161 by uh, a Mr. Uh, Zhang Linzhi, uh, and the same year it was a good year for for rhyme tables. Uh, an almost identical book called uh, oh, I've, there's some kind of you know a kind of typo in the in the title. It's the Jing Jing Yi Lue, Jing Yin Lue. Uh, by uh, Zheng Xiao, which was part of the, this large uh, reference work, this encyclopedia uh, called the Tong Zhi. So these are what we mean when we say rhyme tables, these two books. So uh, what information is given in the rhyme tables? They're, they're, they're a way to give phonetic information about how to read Chinese characters. Uh, so there's a rhyme category, an initial category, a, a rank, and uh, this is one of the, like, let's say, less obvious terms in, in Chinese historical phonology, which we'll come back to. And then whether or not the syllable in question has a medial W. Uh, which is called he ko, uh, so that means closed mouth, because when you have a W, you know, you go wu wu, yeah, <laughs> and then if you don't have a W, then you go ah, so that's open mouth, uh, and that's called kai ko, so, um, so in any case, that's a factor, and that's it, yeah, so this is the, this is the information about Chinese pronunciation that's given explicitly in these books, rhyme category, initial category, rank, and whether or not the syllable has a medial W. So here is chart 23 from the uh, Yunjing. And let's just look at it. It's a grid. So what you have uh, across the top are the uh, place and uh, manner of articulation of the initial. And what you have down the side are the uh, rhyme categories. And then uh, you see that um, uh, down the side, those rhyme categories are broken into four rows. Yeah, so is everyone seeing this, the thing I'm describing? <laughs> yeah. So. Those four rows are called the ranks. That's what I'm calling the, the ranks. So the, 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 there's a very important, I think this is super, super important, 
epistemological point that I'm making, which is when we talk about rhymes and initials and ranks and, and hoko kaiko, we are talking about what you are looking at. Like we're talking about the mise en page of a specific book from, <laughs> from the 12th century. And, and, and that is, you know, what things are built on is so when I say, you know, that this is a, a rank one, uh, you know, uh, like voiced dental initial or something like that, I mean, it's on this page in this column in this row of this book. Now, um, you notice that there, that there are some blank spots. That's because syllables of that structure do not exist in Middle Chinese. So this is a uh, an analysis of, uh, you can say, Middle Chinese phonotactics. Now the the uh, I, I wonder whether I get into this. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll we'll see. Uh, the 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 thing I want to say then is so this is from the Yunjing, this is from the uh, the Qi Yin Lue, and uh, I don't know if, if if you care to look, you will see that uh, it's the same characters. Yeah, with the same holes in the same places. So they clearly are like part of the same uh, philological research tradition uh, and, you know, ha have a, a shared uh, source, but we don't know what it is. Yeah. Or, or I mean, I don't want to overstate that. There's research into that, but, um, uh, but very conveniently for, for us, these two books use different terminology. So the Yunjing uh, actually gives uh, like place and manner of articulation in a way that's analogous to, uh, to, to contemporary um, uh, uh, terminology. So you have things like the teeth sounds, yeah, or the, 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 the top of the tongue sounds. Yeah, so you get articulatory uh, terminology, whereas the the qi yun lue it uses uh, I think the the technical term is acrophonic uh, terms. So it in, in you know you can almost say like um, you know if this were in, in, in English you would say something like the the ball sound or something like that to mean b. Yeah. So it uses a word as an example of the category in order to name the category. So that's nice because the, the two documents use different terminology, but they're structured the same way. They have the same information in them. And, uh, and, then, and then that's a way that gives us a, a kind of concrete phonetic interpretation of the information that's being given. So those are the rhyme tables. It's not an easy question. So what I would say is ranks mean what's going on in, in, in the page format of this book. So uh, I wonder if I, I mean, I don't know how to do this, but, I, but, le but let's just look together at the very upper left corner of this uh, page. You see there's, there's a, a blank spot. Okay. So so that blank spot is in rank one, <laughs> yeah. And then the blank spot immediately below it is in rank two. And the character uh, that I think is pronounced, my Chinese is terrible, but uh, Ran, uh, it is, uh, is in rank three. And then there's a blank spot in rank four. So the ranks really just refers to what row in the page formatting of this document, a character appears in. Now, the, 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 then the question is, well, why did they put different characters in different rows? And there are people out there, you know, this is not the, the majority opinion, but there are people out there who say, well, because they, the page was too short to fit all the characters on one row. <laughs> so they, you know, they put it on four rows, yeah. Um, so that's not the majority opinion, but it gives you a sense that 
this is a hard problem. Now, the 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 thing that's nice is from the and you'll see this in a, in a few minutes from the perspective of old Chinese reconstruction, it kind of ends up not mattering. <laughs> um, but but from the perspective of the the phonetic interpretation of Middle Chinese, it's a very important and very hotly contested question. Nothing to do with tone. It has to like, okay, you know, you're trying to get me to talk about something that cannot be talked about. <laughs> uh, but uh, the, the, the answer is it has something to do with vowel quality or medial. Um, the answer is, is kind of no for methodological reasons, which is to say the you know, lang the way languages change and are learned is from people speaking with their parents and speaking with their friends in the schoolyard. And the, the effect of a prescriptive philological document on, on actual social behavior is, is highly, highly uh, mediated. So there are examples, you know, like, like in English, uh, in my dialect of English, we say wolf. Whereas any historical linguist would tell us we should drop an L in that position, like we do in in half, uh, uh, and that's the influence of the writing. So you know, a, a written tradition can impinge on the development of a spoken language, but only in extremely uh, circumscribed ways that I think played very little role in the history of Chinese. So uh, what, what is the case is, unfortunately, modern Chinese dialectology uh, takes the rhyme tables as their point of departure, where basically what you do is you, you take you know, this, this as a form, and you go and you ask someone to pronounce all the characters. Uh, and, um, and that gives you a certain amount of information about Chinese dialectology, but is, is a highly uh, let's say, uh, particular <laughs> research methodology <laughs> that, uh, that is, is non-standard in dialectology as, a, as an international discipline. So, yeah. Like, like we have to think very careful about, carefully about the, uh, about, how to put it, about imputing phonetic realism onto an abstract object. That's, I think, the way I would put it. So I would say uh, it's, in a sense, a, a good question, but uh, we would need to think about how to even go about interpreting the meaning of the question. Like, what kind of evidence would bear on, um, on pinpointing whether the labial feature of a hook or syllable is associated with the initial or is associated with the rhyme. And, and what I would say is from the, from the perspective of the rhyme tables, you know, uh, this is done at a more abstract level, right? Like, let's just look at this page in front of us and say, on the right, in the vertical column you see at the, at the far right, the very last character is kai. So that means all of the syllables on this page are, uh, let's say, minus labial, right? That's like, we can think of it that way. The, like, it could have been that uh, the feature hoko kaiko by the author of this book was put in, in, in the top. In which case, that person would have been saying that in his analysis, it was a feature of the initial. Or it could have been put on the left, uh, in which case, uh, that person's interpretation would have been that it was a feature of the rhymes. So uh, what, what I would say is from the perspective that the source material presents us with, it's a feature of the whole syllable. Uh, and that's, you know, fine from like, like, let's say if you're a structuralist, that's a perfectly fine uh, answer. So like, I'll maybe leave it, leave it there. Uh, that's an excellent question.
and I will answer it in two ways. Uh, one is, uh, as we're about to see, the point of the rhyme tables, uh, like, like, like the social function of the rhyme tables in the moment that they were published has to be understood. And that has to do with probably writing poetry. I mean, I think there was an analytical component of like just someone wanted to analyze the, you know, what we would say the synchronic phonology of probably the prestige reading dialect of that person. Uh, but that's one angle is we need to think about the, the, the social meaning of the philological act at the time and place in which it was done and recognize that it was already participating in like, for us, it's the starting point in terms of the most concrete information about pronunciation as early as available and as systematic as, as possible. But from the perspective of the Chinese philological tradition, this is a very, you know, late occurrence. And, and so, um, so, so, there's a kind of, uh, you know, a kind of uh, uh, like complicated dialectical relationship with, with like we're looking for, uh, you know, the earliest, most informative source material for some kind of positive information about uh, language at the time, but the 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 primary sources are instead kind of feeding us. Uh, a, 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 a evolving philological tradition as it happens to be preserved by, by chance. So that's kind of the first comment. The second one is it then becomes a, a methodological question for us. And what I would say is uh, it's uh, uh, useful methodologically to assume that all sources point to the same, uh, uh, to use, you know, the Saussure's term, état de langue, right? Like, like, like the same structure. And we, is that true? Of course it's not true. It's, it's, it's an absurdity. It's of course not true. But it's by assuming that all of the primary sources are talking about the same structure that we discover those places where they are not, right? That's the methodological point. That if you assume that you're looking at noise and, and oh, this each document probably is another dialect. If, if, if you make the assumption of heterogeneity, you will find no structure. Whereas if you make the assumption of structure, you will find heterogeneity. So I think that's the methodological principle that I would emphasize. Okay, so uh, now uh, moving on to the rhyme books. So we're moving backwards in time now. Okay, so the rhyme books, uh, there would have been uh, earlier material and, and Mr. Uh, Lu Fayan uh, refers to this, but uh, for all intents and purposes, we can think of the rhyme books as 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 an interlocking uh, uh, genre of uh, philological reference works that all descend from uh, the Che Yun, which was written in 601. Okay, yeah, and then I'll just say, just because kind of charming, the story, I, which which I think is a literary conceit to a large extent is that uh, Lu Fayan um, attended, when he was kind of a young man, he attended a party that his father put on where all of the great, you know, and the good were, were, were there. And they discussed uh, kind of what is good practice in writing, you know, uh, good poetry, yeah? And, uh, and they really, they talked about, okay, well, what about this character? What about this character? And, uh, and then he sort of, you know, listened in and then, it, then many many years later, he sort of published the 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 natural outcome of this party conversation, which is his reference work uh, that that tells you how to pronounce Chinese characters for use in elegant poetic composition. So uh, that book doesn't really exist anymore, unfortunately. So. Um, 
<clears throat> the oldest complete uh, copy of it or edition of it is uh, this Kan Mie Bu Chi Che Yun. Sorry, if my, my Chinese is so awful, but uh, which was published in 706 uh, by uh, Wang Ren Shu. And this uh, book was, was also lost for a long time, but a copy was found. Uh, in the library of the Imperial Palace in the 40s. So, um, <clears throat> so most philological research before the 1940s didn't use it uh, because they didn't know it existed anymore. But it is now the oldest available complete rhyme book. Uh, and then the, the kind of go-to standard uh, before the 1940s and still largely to this day, uh, although I think that's a little bit you know, sloppy because we have an older source uh, is the Guan Yun, which was published in uh, 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 1007, 1008 uh, under imperial patronage. And it has loads of characters in it. You know, the, each of these gets, one of the things that happens is the rhyme books get bigger as people add more and more characters in successive editions. There's an excellent article that is very, very recently published in the Bulletin of Chinese Linguistics that I can send you if you like that discusses the, the, the sort of philology of the rhyme books in terms of, you know, what are the differences between each edition, how have they been preserved and whatnot, uh, that, that is, I think, a really nice, it's a really nice uh, piece of work uh, that I can share with you. But also there's this wonderful homepage uh, that you can, I don't know, uh, I mean, click on <laughs> if you want, uh, uh, that uh, uh, gives, uh, I mean, it's it's really great. It gives it gives like parallel passages in the different editions of the rhyme books, often with photographs and and so on. So now you you know those of you uh, or some of you at least are saying like, oh great, there's some books that were written at certain times and republished, and some of them exist and some of them uh, don't. But what what the hell are in these books? Yeah. So uh, here is a page. Uh, of of uh, the beginning of one of the volumes of uh, the Che Yun, and this is in the first edition. This is the six. I mean, I, I'm simplifying a little tiny bit, tiny bit, but this is the the original edition, which unfortunately only exists in in scraps. Yeah, from Dunhuang mostly, but you know, then we can at least know what uh, it was like. Yeah, and here is my. Uh, transcription of this page. So, you know, if you're like me, you look at this and it's kind of somehow inconvenient to read. So, <laughs> so I've transcribed it and here it is. And I think it's very useful to, you know, I don't know, for, for this is the lesson of me banging my head against the wall. It's very easy when you dip into Chinese historical phonology to become mesmerized by the, the technical terminology and the debates over things like what are the ranks and whatnot. So I think it's really useful to, to know exactly what the, the relevant primary sources actually contain. So let's look at this a little bit and I'll just look at the translation on the right. Uh, so it says there are 54 level tone rhymes. So each of the volumes of the book is a different tone. And then within the volume, so we're in the level tone volume, then uh, we organize it into sort of sections, which are according uh, to the tones. And then within the, sorry, uh, to, according to the rhymes. And then within each rhyme section, it's according to a syllable. And then uh, you have a list of characters that represent that syllable in, and, and those are called syllable groups. Okay, so uh, here we're looking at uh, the, so almost the table of contents of this volume. So it says uh, there are 54 uh, level tone uh, rhymes, and then it, it lists them. So here I, it lists 10, and it lists them using this uh, uh, form of phonetic annotation that we will uh, see uh, a lot, uh, called fanche, where uh, it's um, where where you represent one syllable by giving it two syllables as a gloss. I uh, use uh, the following um, uh, 
uh, English example. We say uh, uh, bone equals bake plus phone. So the point is uh, that we analyze the syllable bone as starting with the same initial as the B in bake and having the same rhyme as the own in phone. And this is what we have here. So you see the, the first, so we have one tung tok plus hong. So it, it's saying, I am naming the rhyme category tung as a, as a, a technical term. And how is it pronounced, you wonder? Ah, the character tung is pronounced tok plus hong. And then second one, I am naming the next category in my book, tong. Uh, it's as a, as a name of the rhyme, yeah? And how do you pronounce the character tong? It's two plus song, yeah? And okay, broadly speak, peak speaking, I think people are with me. So now let's look at uh, a, a, a page from the 704 edition. And just as an aside, uh, this is in this is in my book. This is in my book. This is not in my book because I was only at the time able to get my hands on an extremely blurry picture. And the publisher said, "Oh no, we don't want to publish that blurry picture. It's useless." Whereas now I have access to a very beautiful reproduction <laughs> of, of this book. So if if you you know want it, you can ask me for it. Uh, and I feel both happy and sad because, you know, happy now that I have this nice reproduction, sad that I wasn't able to include a picture of it in my book. Uh, so here is uh, the, uh, a page from the book and its transcription on the right. Uh, but for those of us who have a little trouble reading Chinese, let's look at the translation. Okay, so now uh, in, 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 in terms of the chronology, the thing we first looked at is the is the 602 edition, and this is the seven, I think 704 edition, but we're also talking about a different part of the book. We were looking at the table of contents, and this is like a, an actual entry, like kind of deep in the book, yeah? So we say, yeah, this is a, one of the one of the syllable groups. So we're talking about words that are pronounced yeah. So then it gives a, a, the analysis of the actual pronunciation of the syllable as I just uh, explained using the fanche system. So gyo plus kye, that means gye. Also pronounced kye. Now this also pronounced is not referring to all the words, it's only referring to the first character. Yeah, so it's to say it's a it's very highly compressed way of, of, of imparting information. It says I'm I'm using this character to name this category of, of syllable, but by the way, this character has another pronunciation. And then it gives you uh, you know some information about the writing. It says, oh, oh it, 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 it's it's a it's a vulgar, there's also a vulgar way of, of writing it. Okay, total of nine characters have the pronunciation yeah. Uh, and then it, it gives the character and it gives its meaning. It's already given the pronunciation, right? They're all pronounced yeah, right? And then it says, okay, so we have this character, which is a name uh, of a precious stone. Then we have this character, which means to ride a horse. We have this character, which is like a crow, uh, but with three heads and six tails. So some kind of mythological animal. Then we have this character, which is the ghost of a small child that also has another pronunciation, which is, uh, oh, I don't, I don't give it for some reason. That's a mistake of mine. Uh, and then we have a curved stone that also has another pronunciation. Yeah. And then we have a name uh, of a mountain that also has another pronunciation. So, uh, so now you have a sense of what this book looks like, right? You have the volume according to tone, the sort of chapter according to rhyme character, uh, sorry, rhyme category. Then you have the section according to syllable. And then under each syllable, it lists characters that are pronounced the same as each other. But it gives you little also indications of 
other pronunciations that those particular characters can have. And importantly, those pronunciations, generally speaking, are found in the correct place in the book with a cross-reference back to this place. Yeah? So, so that's the information we have in the rhyme books. Now, uh, one thing that you can say is it's, it's like the phonetic information is less accessible in a kind of schematic way than it was in the rhyme tables you, you saw. And we're not given information like this is a voiced velar or this is a, 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 a nasal final. It's, it's much more murky <laughs> and indirect than that and relies on you knowing the language already, so being able to read these annotations. Right? Okay, so what is the phonetic information available to us in the rhyme books? Okay, we have the tone because we know what volume it's in. We have the rhyme category because we know what, you know, chapter it's in. Uh, and then we have uh, what I'm calling initial chains uh, which I'll get to in, 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 in a moment, uh, but it's, it's because these, these, these annotations where it says, you know, it says, uh, what was my example? Bone is bake plus phone. Well, now I know that bone and bake have the same initial, and then I can look up bake and it will say, ah, bake is, um, uh, you know, um, uh, bulgar plus, uh, cake, and then I can look up Bulgar, and you can make a little chain of initials. So that's what these initial chains are, which are called sheng lei in, in Chinese. That's a modern term, yeah? And then we have the, the divisions, which I will, ret I will just not say anything about at the moment, but say they have a kind of relationship to the ranks that I talked about in, in the rhyme tables, and I'll get back to them. Uh, and then a, a important point I want to make is this hoko kaiko distinction is not recoverable from the rhyme books. It's only recoverable from the rhyme tables. There's, there's no direct way that I can figure out using the cheyun whether a syllable is, is hoko or kaiko. So uh, one thing that, you know, your, your, going to learn about historical Chinese phonology is that it's like epistemologically extremely messy, right? Because if I'm looking at a character and I want to know its, its pronunciation, I can know its tone from 602, but whether or not it has a, a labial medial I, medial, I can only know from a 12th century source. So the time and the space get very messy, which is why I think methodologically speaking, we should assume that uh, unless there's a reason to think otherwise, we're talking about the same language. Okay, so um, right, I think maybe even this is a good place to stop because that was all about Middle Chinese phonology. And Middle Chinese is one of the inputs into Old Chinese. Uh, and what I'm going to now move on to in the presentation are the other inputs into Old Chinese, uh, but that's a kind of different topic, and we, we looks like we only have five minutes left, so I think maybe that's a good place to leave off and to just say that the course is not about Middle Chinese, so uh, uh, for most intents and purposes, you can take, which you've already been seeing, uh, where's an example, Oh, yeah, yeah. Here, you see I have a romanization of the Chinese characters. That romanization is into Baxter's middle uh, chi Chinese transcription system. And, and just an important point to make, it Baxter has not, his, his aim is not to provide a reconstruction of middle Chinese. So these questions like, what exactly does hoko mean? And where is the label feature? He's not worried about that at all. He's just looking for a, a, a systematic romanization of the information that's contained in the rhyme books and the rhyme tables. So, so the point is kind of purely, if you like, that for, for many audiences, seeing 
Roman letters is kind of easier on the eye <laughs> and, and more transparent than uh, looking at the, 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 I mean, looking at the Chinese characters, because also like a Chinese character doesn't contain the information about where it's found in the rhyme tables and the rhyme books. So you would have to gloss it with, actually there's a, there's a system of six other Chinese characters where you say, okay, what's its rhyme category? What's its tone? What's, what's its rank? And so on. So, um, so the, uh, so Baxter has provided this convenient romanization system which you can think of as, if you like, containing, again, no phonetic information per se. It's just a paraphrase of these systematic categories of the rhyme books and the rhyme tables into Roman letters. So uh, the, 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 the point I'm saying is, if you want to worry about the details of, old Chinese, uh, sorry, of middle Chinese phonology, you're welcome to. But if you don't want to worry about them, you can treat Baxter's romanization as a kind of philologically attested representation of a pronunciation. And then worry about things like, you know, was the G pronounced G, right? In the same way that you would with Greek and Latin. That's, that's kind of Baxter's goal is to reduce the use of uh, the rhyme tables and the rhyme books as philological sources to the same kind of problem you have of phonetic interpretation when dealing with uh, an alphabetic representation of a language. So that's, I don't know, that's just something to really sort of hammer home because a, a lot of people criticize Baxter for saying like, you shouldn't write that with an O because it wasn't pronounced A, it was pronounced O, yeah? And that misses the point entirely. He's, he's, he's just trying to represent the categorical information of these two categories of philological sources in a convenient alphabetical representation.